I would like for us to talk about equal employment opportunity laws and more specifically, how do we determine uh, that a hiring decision, a promotion decision, a task that we give to applicants have a disparate or adverse impact? My goal is to talk a little bit about diversity EEO laws and also how we assess disparate impact or adverse impact. That's the goal for tonight. As you know, diversity is defined as real or perceived differences among people with regards to the protected categories, more specifically sex, race, ethnicity, age, uh, disability, or even ability, sexual orientation, religion, and also other attributes that may uh, be associated with these uh, uh, traits. Now, diversity does not necessarily guarantee immediate success. So you can diversify your workforce, but that doesn't mean you're gonna be more productive. Um, however, diversity's potential is unlocked when diversity is accompanied by inclusion. So we can even go beyond inclusion to accessibility. Does everybody have access to the leaders, the decision makers, the data that can be used to make evidence-based decisions? One of the key benefits of diversity is that it is critically important for creativity, for innovation, and for solving complex problems, which obviously we're all facing in our organizations in this post-pandemic era. Diversity affects the firm's reputation, brand, and also overall performance. One of the questions that we can ask is this regarding teams. Is diversity beneficial for work groups and organizations? Um, naturally, we want to say yes. However, we need to say yes based on evidence. Now, all of the research that I have seen regarding diversity in diversity training, in diversity teams, it shows that diverse teams, when they're well managed, they tend to outperform homogeneous teams who are well managed. So remember, both the homogeneous group and heterogeneous group are well managed. They have a good environment, they receive training. However, diverse teams will always be likely to outperform them anywhere from 100% to five to 600% when it comes to um, output. So as you're forming your team, you're always going to go to the storming stage and the norming stage and hopefully performing. If you start with the diverse formation of your team and assuming that the environment is inclusive, assuming that the managers and supervisors are equally capable and effective, chances are that diverse teams will always outperform the homogeneous teams in a complex work environment. So we have different laws. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is an independent federal agency which ensures compliance with EEO laws and provides outreach activities that are designed to prevent discrimination from occurring in the first place. Then you have the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. So it is a division of the Department of Labor, which monitors equal employment opportunity compliance of federal contractors. And these EEO laws apply to companies that have 15 or more employees. They cover business, private employers, government agencies, and many others. The main aim is here to prevent discrimination against employees, job applicants, and trainees in apprentices in the workplace. Now, generally, the EEOC complaint process goes something like this, where an employee or an individual files a complaint with this agency. Then it goes through the process of EEOC reviewing it in making a decision, ultimately after determining whether mediation is necessary or uh, the case should go further, et cetera, et cetera, there is going to be a decision with regards to settlement, a lawsuit, or a right to sue letter that's provided uh, in the case. So this visual basically show you from A to Z what might happen as part of any kind of discrimination re related to the protected categories. EEO laws require applicants or employees to file a complaint, 
as a first step. They apply to all aspects of the employment relationship and they forbid retaliation against those individuals who are involved in discrimination claims. So if you're a manager, be very, very careful to treat everybody, obviously, with respect and dignity, regardless of whether they're part of a lawsuit or complaint or not. The 20-year data from 1997 to 2017 shows you a number of areas where we see discriminatory practices, including racial discrimination. You can see over 28,000 cases sex discrimination, national origin, religion, color, age, disability, and so on. There are laws obviously against all of these, right? So Title VII of the Civil Rights Act prohibit employment decisions based on these protected categories of gender, uh, color, national origin, religion, uh, and so on. It prohibits both intentional discrimination as well as seemingly neutral decision criteria that seems to have a discriminatory impact otherwise known as adverse or disparate impact. This is where analytics comes in. So analytics in HR is the process of collecting, analyzing, interpreting, and reporting people-related data for the purpose of improving decision-making achieving strategic objectives and sustaining a competitive advantage for your organization at any given time in any industry. So we can use data to describe the process of what has been happening, predict the legal consequences if we don't intervene and prescribe a new process in training, in implementation, as well as enforcement. So we can describe, predict, and prescribe basically the whole process of using data to make decisions that make hopefully our organizations a lot better and more inclusive for the workplace for all employees. The scientific process has certain steps. So most experts agree with this process of identifying the problem, doing a background research, forming a hypothesis, testing the hypothesis with experimentation, analyzing the data and communicating those results to everyone involved, whether they're employees, whether they're managers, whether it is other relevant stakeholders like stockholders that need to know the information. Now, our goal for today is disparate treatment and disparate impact analysis. Disparate, disparate treatment is different from disparate impact. So disparate treatment exists when individuals in similar situations are treated differently because of their race, color, religion, gender, national origin, age, or disability status. Whenever people are treated differently because of these protected categories, there is an actual intent to treat them differently. So the plaintiff must prove that there was a discriminatory intent or motive, that is, that the employer intended to discriminate. However, in disparate impact, it is not intentional discrimination. Nonetheless, adverse impact occurs when a facially neutral employment practice disproportionately excludes a protected group from employment opportunities. So how do we determine if there was a disparate impact in a protected group in your organization? We can use what is known as the 80% rule or the four-fifths rule, or we can use the statistical analysis like chi-square test to determine based on alpha value whether there was or has been a disparate impact on a protected group. So our goal for tonight is to understand the fourth fifth rule and also to use chi-square uh, for assessing disparate impact. So the fourth fifth rule or the 80% rule states that a test has disparate impact if the higher rate for the minority group is less than the four fifths or 80% of the higher rate for the majority group. So in this case, if you're offering a cognitive test or a physical ability test between men and women, and you notice that uh, 
basically less than 80% of women are being hired compared to the men, that means there's a disparate impact for women using that specific assessment test. So the same thing can be applied to age, to skin color, to ethnicity, to religion, to assess if there was a disparate or adverse impact on the protected group. Now, you can hopefully see a lot more online in your textbook and also other sources about the four-fifths rule. So there's a lot of data. One of the videos that I've seen comes from 2016 on YouTube called the four-fifths four rule, which gives you some really good practical examples. So I want to show you some of these. And obviously, you're welcome to look at the video yourself and look at the details. And they mentioned that there are basically five different steps to follow in this process. Number one, you identify the policy or practice that's being applied. Number two, you calculate the selection rate for each group, both majority and minority, or the two groups that are being tested. Three, identify which group has the highest selection rate. Four, you calculate the adverse impact ratios. And fifth, determine if adverse impact actually exists. Obviously, as a result of these five steps, you would make a determination to remedy the situation, to prevent this from happening to other individuals or future candidates. So one of the examples we can see is that in this case, 100 men and 100 women applied to be police officers. 80 men and 60 women were selected. So in this case, if 80 men are selected, you assess the percentage of men being selected from all these applicants, so that would be 80%. In the case of women, that would be 60% because 60 women out of 100 were selected. Now, by looking at it, does this mean that there is a disparate impact on the female group? Well, you could probably tell that 60% obviously is um, less than 80%. However, we have to analyze the ratios to determine if the 60% is actually less than 80 of this group to prove, in fact, there is or there is not a, an adverse impact. So men have the highest selection rate for the police officer position at 80%. In this case, we divide the 60% to 80% for men. So usually the minority group that you want to assess compared to the majority group would be in the numerator, and the majority group would be in the denominator here. So we can easily see that the selection rate for women is 75%. So based on this, we say that there is adverse impact for women. Why? Because the fourth fifth rule says that this ratio should be 80%. So 75% is less than 80%, which indicates that there is a discriminatory impact on the female candidates. So it doesn't have to be any more difficult than just this example. So let's look at another example where adverse impact impacting black versus white candidates for a position. In this case, you have 80 white applicants, out of which 48 are selected. And you have 40 black applicants, out of which 12 are selected. So we do the same thing. 48 over 80 gives you a ratio of 0.6 or 60%. For black candidates, 12 over 40, 12 selected out of 40 candidates, that gives you 0.3 or 30% ratio. So the impact ratio is three, 0.3 over 0.6, which gives you 0.5. The impact ratio of 50%, again, is less than 80%, which is evidence that based on the forfeit rule, there is adverse impact and something needs to be done in order to make the assessment process 
equal for all groups being selected for the position. Now we can take the example a little bit further here. So let's assume the same ratios here. And we determine usually when you're given the numbers. So in the previous slide here, we we're given the numbers and we assessed everything, right? We came up with 50%. You can do this on Excel. And in this case, we would determine or calculate the marginals. So these totals are called marginals, whether you look at this column, the marginals or this row of totals. So we always have to calculate the marginals for each of these areas. So Excel can help you to determine the alpha value or basically the ratios more easily. So then this is for the observe what was happening. We come up with the expected, the expected values. So the expected values are basically what would happen if whites were being selected independently and blacks were being selected independently. How many would be selected? That's the whole point here uh, when we're looking at the numbers. So the marginals, again, are calculated and they should be exactly the same as the observed values. In the selection rate here, we know is 0.5% for blacks over white. In white selection rate is 0.6, in black selection rate is 0.3, which were calculated in the previous slide. Now we can determine using the observed values and the expected values in Excel by highlighting the two for a chi-square test of independence, you'll get an alpha value or p-value of 0.002. So this value is less than 0.05, less than 0.05, which is a typical cutoff value for something being significant or not significant. So in this case, we would say we would say there that is a statistically significant difference between whites and blacks being selected for this position. Anytime the alpha value or the p-value is less than 0.05, that means there is a statistically significant difference in the hypothesis or between, for the two groups. So in other words, one group is being discriminated against based on the adverse or disparate impact so theory. These videos are very, very helpful. My recommendation is try to work out the problem. Now let's look at this on Excel. Okay, so now you should be able to see the Excel file. One of the first things you would do is label them, right? So you have the number of men and women who pass and fail a test. These are the observed or actual values that we have here. Now the goal is to eventually get to the expected values. And we can mark that a different color. So the first thing you have to do is create the marginals or the totals here, right? Both on this side as well as on this side. So in this case, to create the total, what do we do? Type equal S U M and then we would select this part, okay, I selected that twice, I guess that's no good. And then we go with this part and 160, is that correct? It seems to be correct, right? Yes. So, all right, so all we did was you can see the formula here, right? Equal sign, sum, and then parentheses. So B3, which would be 70 and then C3 with a colon in between 90. So that sums it up. Now, sum. B3. B4. Okay, 112. So in this case, eventually I got it right, right? So now I copy and paste this. It'll work on the next column. Okay, so it gives you that number. 
162. So that should be the correct number. Now we can go in total, copy 114 and create a total here, 274. So it seems like it should be the correct number. So we got a total for this area. We got the total here, which somehow I, by mistake, I erased. Okay, so there we go. So we have a total here. And you would basically do the same thing for the bottom for expected values. So in this case, we can copy the table and then just wipe out the numbers. So you would do exactly the same. Okay, so now for pass rate, again, we type men. Sorry, it's gonna be a little bit slow here. Women. And Janice, you did this already, <laughs> so you're ahead of everybody. Put parentheses. We'll go here with, in this case, we would go with the total for men, which is 160. That would be D3. D3. So we would multiply. Multiply here is by basically a star. And so multiply that by the total pass rate. So in this case, that would be 112, which is B6. So B6, we would close that. And then we would divide that by the total number, which is 274. That would be D6. So D6. Okay, so you see the number 65 we got. So, and then we follow basically the same process with the rest of them, but you cannot copy and paste here because each one is different, right? So in this case for fail, the number of people who failed, we would go with again, 160 that is the number or the total there for men. So in this case, we would go with D3. Okay, so equal parentheses, D3, multiply by, the fail for total in this case would be 162. So that would be C6, C6. So you multiply that together and divide them by the total number, which is D6, D6. Okay, so you get 94. And then for women here, which is 114, so we would go equal, 114, which is D4, D4, multiply that by B6. We multiply that by B6, B6, which is 112. And we divide all of this by the total, which is 274. That would be D6, D6. And hit enter, you get 46. And finally, okay, so we would multiply 114, which is D4, D4 multiplied by C6, and then divide that by 274, which is D6, D6, okay, 67. Okay, you see, so you discover your own problem. In this case, you know, it should have been 114, same as above, but, you know, it gives us the right number when we do all the marginals correctly. So again, we have to create the total for pass and fail. So in this case, we sum up again. So equal SUM. And in this case, we would add B10 with B11. B10 would be 11, okay, 112. And then same thing here, equals sign, and then SUM, it would be C10 and add it to C11, close the parentheses, equals. So you see the numbers should come out all the same. Finally, we have to go with this number, right? We still have to create the total, which should come out to the same thing. So sum equals S-U-M. OK, 
Okay, so in this case, we would say D10 plus D11. D10 added to D11. Okay, 274. These are the observed and expected numbers. The observed you already had, we created the marginals. The expected we did not have, you have to create these numbers. And you can actually change this instead of all these um, point zero zero whatever, right? We can change the numbers to make them less. So on my computer, you can go and select number and you can make it just two digits to make it simple for yourself. Um, so I'll, I'll leave two, two point decimals here, but you can make it just, uh, you know, integers by themselves uh, or just two numbers. So now our goal here is to do alpha tests, right? To look at the chi square of independent tests. So in this case, you can go to formula and sometimes insert function. And in this case, you should see it here. If you don't see it, go to all of them. And so I'll select chi square test. It comes up. Now it gives you these two areas for options. So in the actual range, that would be the observed. So you can actually, instead of typing it, you can go and select all of these. Mm -hmm. And you notice it automatically created B3 to C4. So mm -hmm. that means the whole table is selected. Then you click on the expected range and you can go and select here or you can type it. So you can see it selected B10 all the way to C11. So it makes it a little bit easier, especially if you only have one hand that's functional, <laughs> but it makes it easier. So then you hit okay and you hit okay. So this is your alpha value. And mm -hmm. what I would what I would do is always type alpha value or t test. Actually, you can call it alpha value or t test. Let's say I'll call it alpha value. Professor, can you show me how you got to that again? I no, I'm sorry, I missed it. How you got to put in that formula? Okay, yeah, that? sure. In my case, I can easily go under formula. Mm -hmm. insert function fx so if you click on this it gives you this little table insert function you can choose the sum for example i was typing sum right sum but you can just select here yeah. but yeah for this case we would just use chi square uh, test so you hit okay you click on that hit okay it automatically gives you this table and then while, once you're in the actual range which is the top table you can go and highlight the actual table. So it brings in the range there for you. Then you go to expected, and then you go again to the expected table and it brings the range for you. Or you can just type it like I was doing with summing earlier, but depending on which way is faster for you. And then you hit okay. And it typed the number right here. This number. Now, when you're looking at this number, is that, um, is that significant or no? No. No. Why not? Because it's less than 0.5 or something. Oh, five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your conclusion is your conclusion is right, right. But it's it's the other way. It's it's more than 0.05, right? But your conclusion is correct. It is not significant because it is not less than 0.05. So it would be significant if it was less than 0.05. We would say in this case that there's no difference between the, these two group, different groups. In other words, there's no discrimination in this case for women. Uh, so th that, that's what that means. Um, sometimes there could be um, slightly fewer women selected, but it's not statistically significant to say that there was discrimination. So we can say that disparate impact occurs when a hiring selection process or promotional practice disproportionately excludes a protected group from opportunities of being hired, being promoted, or being selected for a specific team. Now we're not assessing one, two or three people, right? We're looking at data over a year, over a two year, over a three year period. So this way, once you have a large number of people, you can see that there is a pattern. But if it's just basically two or three people, 
that's not evidence that men are discriminated against or women are discriminated against or African-Americans are discriminated against or people with disabilities are discriminated against. But we're looking at pattern based on much more data over time. So what should organizations do to proactively defend against disparate treatment claims or even disparate impact? Well, you can show that there was non-discriminatory reason like job relatedness for adverse action against the applicant or the employee. You can also use the bona fide occupational qualification uh, theory. So where protected characteristic is an essential quality of the job, employers have to demonstrate that discrimination is job related. In other words, make sure it is a legal form of discrimination. For example, if you're working at Disney World and they say, you have to be Vietnamese to work at the Vietnamese pavilion. That means, although I might speak Vietnamese, I'm not qualified because I am not Vietnamese. So they could discriminate based on BFOQ qualification or bona fide occupational qualification that I'm not the right candidate. So they would hire somebody who is actually Vietnamese, thereby discriminating against me legally. So that would be already written in their a job description that you have to be a Vietnamese. There's the uniform guidelines on employee selection procedures, which outlines how selection systems can be designed to comply with the EEO laws. So again, all of your uh, hiring practices, promotional practices should be aligned with the laws so you're not illegally discriminated against a protected group of individuals or candidates. In summary, let me say that you need to build a reputation for being an objective, analytic, and a rational professional at all times. You can do this by analyzing the numbers, by analyzing the data and all of the facts that surround the situation to make evidence-based decisions at all times, thereby avoiding any disparate impact on any group of candidates in your workplace. And for more information, obviously look at the book, more specifically look at chapters four and other chapters that relate to diversity, uh, equity and inclusion that talk about adverse impact and adverse treatment as well as EEO laws. Thank you, have a good night and good luck with the session. Thank, Thank you. you, good night. Thank you.